So yeah, I'm going to be talking about Spark data sets and how they relate to functional programming. Um, and this talk is probably actually going to be a little bit sad, despite the title, um, because it turns out that while we can keep the fun in Spark and functional programming, there's a lot of work that we maybe forgot to do that we should do to catch up. Um, and, and we'll talk about how we can do that. Uh, I'll try and trick people into doing my work for me um, as a proud open source maintainer. Um, but also we'll, we'll focus on like some cool things that you can do too. Um, so it'll be good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, my preferred pronouns are she or her. I'm a developer advocate at Google. Um, you can find my slides on SlideShare. Um, my tweets, according to the speaker from Twitter, are not very important. Um, we were drinking last night. Uh, but you can also follow me on Twitter. Um, one of the things that I've started doing is code review live streams. So if anyone's interested in seeing more about how sort of the open source process works in the Apache way, um, when you have giant projects and lots of competing commercial interests, um, you can watch that there. And it's not as sad as that sounds. Um, and if you want to give me feedback on this talk, I have a, a little Google survey that you can fill out. No pressure. Um, I, I, I do read it, so keep that in mind when you submit it. Um, so I am also trans, queer, Canadian. I you live in America on a work visa that they're debating whether or not they want to keep, um, and part of the leather community. And this is not related to Spark or functional programming. There is no secret Canadian garbage collector that we've been hiding from you. Um, we all live with G1GC and are very happy with it. But um, I think it's important to remember that we're all from different backgrounds. And if we work together, we can get through this a lot faster. And if we spend our time fighting with each other, we're just going to burn the world down with distributed systems and sadness. And so we should you know, be respectful of our colleagues, regardless of where they're from. And life will get better, um, but not immediately. OK, uh, so this is Boo. Uh, she also uses she, her pronouns. She is the author of Learning to Bark and High Performance Barking. It's currently out of print. Um, there's been some supply issues because they're done in pen, and uh, she does not have opposable thumbs. Um, so we're working on that. Uh, and you can definitely follow her on Twitter as well. Uh, she is not a Scala programmer yet working on that. So um, I, I feel I might as well mention why my employer cares about Spark, since they pay me money. Um, and we have two hosted services that you can run Spark on top of, one with support and one um, for more adventurous people. Um, so we have Cloud Data Proc, and we have Google Kubernetes Engine. I'm pretty sure that's the name of it. Um, and you can deploy Spark on top of that. And if anyone wants to help me but isn't willing to write my software for me, and you are using Spark, how many people are using Spark here, by the way? <gasps> Yay! If you want to keep us from breaking your pipelines, you can try out the new release candidate and tell us if there's any regressions, because otherwise, you find out after we broke your software. And if you tell us first, then we might not break it. We might still break it because we're lazy. But there's a good chance that we'll fix whatever bug we introduce that affects you. Um, so I'm hoping you're all friendly people. It does look like there are a lot of Spark users in the house. Is there anyone new to the Scala community? Like this is their first Scala conference, their first time using Scala. Yay! Welcome, new friends. Thank you for coming to the Scala community. Um, we're relatively friendly. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to have you. I'm always happy to see more people here. Uh, and yeah, so that's pretty cool. Oh, right. If you really don't like pictures of cats, there are many other talks available to you. Um, this is not the one for you. So um, I'm going to talk about what Spark is for the people who don't know Spark, just super briefly. I'll mention why I think it's helped drive functional programming into the enterprise. We'll talk about what Spark's new APIs mean, how we can still do functional programming with them, but how it's maybe not going to be as much of an on-ramp as we used to see 
um, which is a little sad. Um, we'll talk about some of the cool things that I can do with data sets, which are really awesome, that were like way too much work to do like on RDDs. So if you have some problems that you've been like putting off solving because they were super gnarly, um, this will hopefully help you. And uh, I forgot to mention we were going to look at some machine learning in here, um, just for good measure. There's no deep learning, so San Francisco people, I'm sorry. Um, but I'm in Europe, so I figured maybe you wanted software that worked. Um, and we'll talk about how we can make this more awesome for the people who come after us and, and make sure they still learn functional programming and they aren't seduced by the dark side of SQL. Um, because I, don't, I want more functional programming nerds to hang out with. Uh, that's the long and the short of it. So Spark is a general purpose distributed system for parallel data processing. It's an Apache project. And if it's a much faster than Hadoop MapReduce. Uh, Hadoop MapReduce set the bar down at about where my heel is. Um, very nice of MapReduce. I, Really great innovator, um, but not fast at all. So that's great. I love it when I have really low bars to achieve success. Um, and it's good for when our problems get too big for a single machine and has two core abstractions. One of them is really functional, and the other one is a little less functional. But we can, we can still work with it and have fun. Um, so for the people who aren't currently using Spark, um, maybe you'll go run a MapReduce job or a Hive job. It'll take 16 hours, and while it's running, you can just learn Spark. The book is not that big, and um, it does Adderall is available by prescription here. Talk to your doctor. Tell them you want to learn a new programming uh, tool. Um, the other reason that people come to Spark, and this is normally for people who are in the Python world, is they have a data frame. They try and load it in memory. Uh, it runs out of memory, and then they think the solution to that is distributed systems. Later on, they are depressed, but at that point, we've already converted them to functional programming, so it's fine. Um, and a little bit of magic. Yay, magic. Um, so what is the magic of Spark? So for me, the first time I saw Spark, I was like, oh, hey, this actually does the things that people told me we, we could do with functional systems that I haven't seen people bothering to do, right? Like, I can take advantage of the fact that my data is immutable, and Spark enforces it and requires it, and then takes advantage of the fact that the data is immutable to parallelize the work. Um, it has some really cool optimizer. Um, it, it actually has three different optimizers, depending on which mode, but it's not super important. Um, and it takes a different approach to resiliency. Um, and so it recovers from failures rather than protecting from failures. And in the MapReduce world, we save things out to three different computers, and we assume we won't have three computers fail at the same time which that's, that works out pretty well. In the Spark world, we say everything is made of Cheetos. Um, and sometimes our Cheetos will blow away. But it's OK. I can just buy more Cheetos. Um, hmm, that, maybe the Cheeto-based analogy. Do, do you have Cheetos here? OK. I don't know why it wasn't working then. Um, but essentially, <laughs> uh, Spark just says, hey, I'll keep track of all of the work you've asked me to do. If I lose some of it, I'll just recompute it, and it'll be fine. And I think it's the best way to trick people into learning functional programming, because you don't have to tell them that's what they're doing. You can go to them, and you can be like, do you want to learn distributed systems and do cool machine learning problems? And people are like, that sounds like fun. And then we're like, here, have a lambda. And they're like, hmm, o OK. I'll, I'll roll with that. Um, right. And so Spark is not just like one monolithic, well, it is one giant monolithic project, and it has so many different things inside of it. We have two separate graph algorithms that do not work. Um, we have two separate machine learning libraries. Uh, this one's deprecated, and that one's new and doesn't quite work. Um, we have two separate streaming systems. Uh, this one's deprecated, and I never really worked. And this one has two different execution engines, neither of which do exactly what you want. But you can pick the trade-offs that are closest to what you're willing to accept and pretend that it works. Yay! O OK, or not. Um, and. Obviously, probably most of the people here are going to work with Spark and Scala. But I think one of the nice things about it is if you're working with data scientists or other people in your organization, you may not be able to immediately convince them to learn Scala. But you can convince them to learn Spark with Python, because you can be like, no, no, it has a Python API. And that's 
technically true. Um, but the Python API teaches them functional programming concepts, and then later you can come back and be like, well, yeah, your code is kind of slower than mine. Here, let me show you how to rewrite it into Scala. It stays pretty much the same. And they're like, oh, well, that's, that seems like a win. Um, I don't mention this part at the Python conferences I speak at. Um, and so if anyone's watching the recording, I'm sorry. Uh, whatever. OK, so Spark got some cool things right for making functional programming fun for distributed systems. Um, it sort of strongly enforces immutable data. You can break it, but then your program doesn't work. Um, it has functional operators on its distributed collections. And it has lambdas for everyone, not just Scala people. We very strongly encourage Python people. They have lambdas, and all of our examples show them how to use this. Um, it solved a business need. There are lots of cool functional programming frameworks which have existed before Spark but many of them didn't solve a need that businesses thought they have. Um, and Spark solved a business need, whether it's real or imaginary, that lots of businesses thought they had. They think they have big data, even if their data fits on a floppy disk. They have big data, and they need a cluster. And so they can run Spark on their cluster. And it, regardless of whether or not this business need was real, they, they think they want it, and so that's important. Um, and the, the last one is, it, it makes it really hard. So I. Don't get me wrong, I still write code with vars. I'm not a good person. But Spark makes it hard to use vars as like global state or, or things which are really bad. It makes it challenging to do things that are bad. Not impossible, because sometimes we all have to peel back the curtain and murder the person typing on the machine um, to get what we want done. But it strongly discourages them and makes them really awkward, um, which, is, which is good. OK. And it got a bunch of things not so right that makes functional programming with Spark kind of painful. Um, one of the things is our approach to serializing closures is um, we have this wonderful piece of software called closurecleaner.scala. And we have an equivalent in Python. And in R, I haven't looked because I'm terrified. Um, but essentially, we take the Java serialized closure and then just start deleting things from it. Um, and it's faster most of the time, but occasionally not so faster, um, and occasionally wrong. And then people think that closures have limitations, which they don't really have. They only have limitations because we're doing some crazy things to make their software go fast, right? That if they were using closures in another context would be totally fine, right? Like referencing things in your outer class, totally fine to do in a normal closure. Doing that in a Spark closure makes your life really sad. Um, and sometimes people can get these things confused, because to them, Spark and Scala can be hard to separate. Um, another one is we, oh, right, we like strings everywhere for settings, right? Everyone loves setting strings, right? It's the best way to convey integer information is inside of a string. And Spark's configuration definitely embraced that philosophy. Um, so sometimes we maybe encourage people to do things with types which are not so right. Um, and that's cool. And uh, it's really hard to debug. And sometimes it is actually Scala's fault. And other times, it's that Spark gave you 400 copies of the stack trace and uh, won't tell you which one's important. Um, it, it literally will often give you two times the number of machines in your cluster plus some constant factor number of stack traces back when you have an exception. And this can feel overwhelming. Um, even for me, I when I get 400 stack traces, even though in the like non-lizard part of my brain, I'm like, yeah, that's fine. Everything's fine. It's the dog sitting in the room with fire. Um, the lizard part of my brain is like, no, it's on fire. There's 400 stack traces. Stop now. Investigate. And and so that's that's sad. And we also introduced two new APIs, and they were both introduced by going like. How important are types anyways? Um, and unfortunately, we found out the answer to that question. Um, and it turns out they were kind of useful. Uh, and so we just tried to shove some types back in really quickly while no one was looking and be like, yeah, uh, it's always had types. What are you talking about? That old API doesn't exist anymore. <clears throat> Um, and actually, we yeah. If anyone wants to see the data frame deprecation, it's super hilarious what we did. Um, but it, it doesn't work for Java users. Uh, are there actually are there any Java users in the house? Don't be afraid. Um, okay. So six. 
people and one person who doesn't want to admit it, but their friend thinks they use Java. Um, and that's fine, right? And, and I think this is actually really good because we can slowly start to bring the Java people over into our world by being like, I'm, I'm just saying, word count is like 10 lines, man. It's cool. Come join the dark side. We have cookies um, and confusing stack traces, but think of the cookies. OK, so uh, what are the new APIs? So we have a streaming system with three different engines. Keeps it super exciting, really hard to debug because no one really understands all of them. So uh, when it doesn't work, you try switching the engine. And now you have a whole new stack trace. Yay! OK, no excitement. Um, we introduced this thing called data frames where we were like, types, types are for suckers. You know what everyone loves? Runtime schema evaluation. And then, then no one loved that, except the Python people. But even they were like, uh, I have some feelings. And we were like, well, no. Um, and a new machine learning API, because obviously machine learning jobs don't take very long to run. It's totally OK to do no type checking in your machine learning API and assume all of the fields requested are present and fail at the very end of a 24-hour model training job. It was a great decision. OK. Um, sarcasm, too. Um, sorry. Uh, OK, so data frames, what did we do? Uh, we were like, everything is a row. That's great. It was not so great. Um, and we actually, we, we made sad decisions. We made everything SQL inspired. And are there SQL people in the house who really like SQL? OK. Four people will really love the data frame v1 API. It, it feels like you're writing SQL in Scala. Yay! But without type checking. It's not like the fancy SQL. Like, it's just like regular sad SQL. Um, or not sad. Nah, fuck. That didn't get better. Um, <laughs> OK, uh, we realized that we should add some functional operators to it. Um, and we did, sort of. But one of the things which we didn't do was add them in a way that's easy for people in other languages to use. Um, and so we can't use them as easily to convert the Python people to the dark side with cookies. Um, so they're like, no, it's fine. I know SQL. And then I'm like, oh, but, but I have cookies for you. And they, they walk away. Um, anyways, yeah. But they have some cool things about them. They're a lot faster, and they have the potential to allow us to interoperate with other languages better. And this is really cool if your desire to rewrite your coworker's Python code into Scala is about zero. Um, you, can, you can use their chunk of like really complex numeric computing inside of Scala. Um, and that's kind of neat. And I have a graph which you should all believe and trust as a vendor. Because vendors never lie. Um, so we can see here, we have two RDD operations. Um, this is computing, I think, some average information over some arbitrary data set. And um, we can see that the data frame one takes much less time. And that's good. Yay, faster. Faster is better. The only sadness is I had to give up functional programming. So I sold my soul for like uh, maybe five minutes. Um, and that's like not, that's not a trade off that I would make, but unfortunately it's a trade off that a lot of other people have made. And I want to steal them back to my side. And yeah, our storage is a lot more efficient. It turns out when you're competing against Java serialization, once again, it's like competing with MapReduce, not that hard. Um, but we have a nice graph, which is like, yeah, 50% more efficient. Just hands. OK, um, whatever. And there are other things that we could use, and the comparison then becomes a lot less impressive. It's true. But it is still like 5 to 10% more impressive. So how do we use these things to do terrible SQL stuff, but still do cool functional code, right? Um, so uh, this is. OK. Um, we can tell ourselves it's a DSL rather than SQL, if that helps us feel like we're still part of the cool kids club. Um, so we have this triple equals operator. So much excitement. Um, the great thing is uh, double equals will sometimes compile here and then just result in crap. Um, other times it will not compile, and that's lovely. Yay? Yay! Excitement. OK. Um, so we can see the select thing, that looks a lot like SQL, right? Select select and SQL are totally the same thing. But that reduce function, 
some good, happy, functional programming, just like mom used to bake. Um, so that's cool. And yeah, so we can put arbitrary Scala code into um, data sets. And we can, we can actually keep our nice little map operator. Yay, everyone loves map, right? Map is my favorite, uh, next to flat map, who is my real favorite, because flat map is in word count, and word count is the best example. Um, and this is really good, because I don't ever want to actually have to properly learn SQL, but I do want my code to run faster, right? Um, and I want to be able to work with people who have learned SQL without having to rewrite all of their stuff into Scala, because then I'd probably have to learn SQL in the process. Um, and we can do word count with it. Yeah, everyone loves word count. Right? Word count! One vaguely excited person. <laughs> the same person who betrayed his Java programmer friend. Um, so that's cool. <coughs> but uh, this is load some arbitrary data, selects a text field out of it, tells Spark the type. Um, and this, this part's a little sad. Like We have to ex explicitly specify our type once we've loaded our data. Um, but that can be pretty much any case class. Um, it's just because we have a string, we don't, we don't have to define a case class of the word string. That would be kind of redundant. And then we can still have our fun flat map. The only problem is when I get to this group by operator, I lose all of my type information. Yay! Types are for suckers anyways. But um, the cool thing about this is that group by in Spark is terrible. Um, how many people have called group by key on RDDs? OK, keep your hand up if it worked. Um, one person had it work. Yeah, kind of? OK, so group by key is not always breaking your code. But when you encounter big data, group by key will probably break your code. And you're probably using Spark because of big data. Um, and now, if you have high cardinality information and your, your groups don't actually have that much intersection, group by key is fine. It's just part of the API which we introduced, which 90% of the time when it's called results in an out of memory exception, which to me was a sign that this was something we should double down on and introduce in our new API, but this time without out of memory exceptions. Um, and so the nice thing here is that this aggregate function actually understands what's happening, because we're writing it in a DSL rather than arbitrary Scala code. Um, and that's a little sad, right? Like, I don't have whatever code I want here. But Spark knows what's happening, and it's able to pipeline this, essentially, reduction operator while it's grouping the data together. And it doesn't have to make this like giant list and then fail and be sad. I can, I can be happy, briefly. And I'll get an out-of-memory exception another day, but yeah. So how do we do things that were hard to do with RDDs? Um, we put on a trash bag, trash bag, um, and are a cat. OK, so this is this impressive to anyone? No one. OK, so this is impressive to me. Um, and this is because doing this on the RDD API is really, really terrible. Right? Like, this is an incredibly simple concept that is really annoying to express with reduced by key in Spark. And so it's kind of cool. I can have my functional programming. And then when I want to compute a bunch of things that are, are comparatively actually simple, but really annoying to express, because I have to keep track of like x1, x2, x3, or make like a weird case class to keep track of all of these different things, I can just let the computer do that for me. Yay! So th this is. This is the kind of thing which is impressive to the people that wrote it. Um, so it's cool, trust me. The other thing is windowed operations. So um, essentially trying to look at uh, some of our data over you know, plus minus k or j, right? So I want to look at some number of records before, some number of records after. I can have some type of sorting order. This is also really annoying to do in Spark and distributed systems in general. Window operations kind of suck. They're super easy to do on one computer, but they're really frustrating to do here. And so, yeah, OK, so we can see it goes, the window shifts down. 
I probably should have put some results in there, but just pretend that I was less lazy and filled in the second half of the slide. Um, and so this is what our window spec can look like. We can say, I'm interested in knowing um, the capital gains tax in America for people 10 years younger than me, 10 years older with some average, mostly because I want to see like how many more stock options I should be asking my boss for. Um, and I. I want to know an average because you know people my age might not be completely representative. But like the nice thing is this is so much less work. The only downside is it's not very functional, um, right? I'm kind of restricted to this average, um, or I mean I'm not restricted to just average. There's like obviously min and max as well. Yay! Um, there's there's actually a large number of built-in aggregate functions, but like I might have some special business logic. In this case, I would probably replace this with max times two, so that when I go and ask my boss for more money, it's like, yeah, the computer says you should pay me more, and you should not read my notebook, but pay me more. Um, that's never worked, but if it works for you, congratulations. Um, so that's that's kind of sad. Um, we'll skip UDFs. They're they're sad. We're gonna go look at custom aggregates. Everyone loves writing case classes to aggregate data, right? OK, zero people. Um, so this is really, really ugly. Um, I have the mutable aggregation buffer, and I return unit. And I have update, and I return unit. And I have merge, and I return unit. And I have evaluate, and I return any. Oh. Yeah, <clears throat> this API definitely shows that we were like, types, what are those? Um, that's, that's unfortunate. Um, so it would actually be quite possible to go ahead. So we can make a user-defined aggregate function, and then we can go back to our window thing, wherever the hell that was. And then we can use our user-defined aggregate function here. And that's, I mean, it's better than being stuck with the built-in options. But is anyone really excited about filling in the definition of this class? Yeah, no one. So uh, essentially, because we made the API this way, it's really ugly. But it doesn't have to be, right? It's not inherently ugly. And this is actually one of the things which we could fix if people thought it was important. Does anyone think that they would prefer a different aggregate? Maybe one that looks like a, a normal aggregate? Is there... OK. Does anyone think that enough that they want to make a PR? Damn it. Oh, yay. OK, we're going to hang out after this. Um, and the people who were like, yeah, I want this to be better, would you be willing to, say, comment on a PR saying the old thing was terrible? Maybe? OK, one, one person will help me, and I can create some extra GitHub accounts. Um, <clears throat> please don't. Ah, damn it. I'm not a very good evil person because I share my evil plans on camera. Um, yeah, OK, well, this is also boring. So um, I, I mentioned that we have a lot of things that are, are built in. And it's not just aggregates. We have like all, all kinds of functions. And it's cool. Everything takes in either a string or a column. Yay! Um, and the, the string name, it references a column that may or may not exist, and you'll find out at runtime. Um, and you can actually define columns which don't exist as well. It takes a little bit more work, but I've done it by accident. Um, and so that's really cool and really great to try and compute the min of like maybe a binary field. And then at, at runtime, find out that Spark says, no, I don't know how to compare these two. And then you're just like, oh. Sad. Um, but thankfully, the, the frameless people um, brings type columns. And you can actually write functions which, which check that the types are the right types. Not, not even just that the types are the right types, but that the column exists in your input data, which is some fancy shit right there. Um, admittedly, like they don't have complete one-to-one -one parity, I think, with all of the functions in functions.scala. But you can add your own and just make a custom local Maven publish. That's normal, right? That's great. OK, um, cool. Let's talk about another API that's sad um, and we can fix, maybe. So Spark ML pipelines are scikit-inspired. Scikit is notably in, in Python. And Python, notably, is not what one would consider a strongly typed language. Um, you, you can add type annotations to it, but uh, Scikit did not. And neither did we. Um, <coughs> 
And instead what we did is we said, I love runtime schema checking. What I'll do is when you ask me to train on some data, I'll see if that data looks kind of like what I expected based on the programmer remembering to write a function called validate. Um, and that works at least some of the time. Um, the only problem is when it doesn't, um, machine learning jobs often take more compute resources than I'm worth, um, right? Especially if I don't own the computers outright, right? Like running this on a bunch of GPUs gets really expensive. And so having this fail for like silly type errors is really frustrating. Once again, frameless to the rescue, blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, we can, we can see, ooh, strings. We don't even take columns here. So we, don't, we have no idea if this data exists or not. Um, and it's great. And then I make this pipeline, which concatenates two things into a vector and turns a category into a category index. Um, and that's essentially just because we can't actually handle strings. Um, so we have to turn them into integers for you behind your back. It's OK. Um, actually, not integers, floating points, um, <laughs> which are great for comparing categorical features. Um, sometimes 1.0 is equal to 1.0, and I'm really happy about those times. It's the other times that I'm less happy about. Um, whatever, we don't have to worry about how this pipeline works too much, but what matters is, oh no, we'll, we'll skip this, this is sad. Um, what matters is I can train a decision tree on top of it, world-class machine learning. Um, <clears throat> we can also actually put in deep learning if you're just trying to raise money and you don't need a real model. Um, but you can also swap in linear regression or really whatever you want, and you can just tell Spark to train this and it'll train all of the things together and it'll output the result. The only downside of doing it this way is if you're doing it in, say, for example, a notebook, when it fails, you 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 don't get the partial result back. You just get the, the, the pipeline fitting failed. And so if you're interactively developing in a notebook or a REPL, this is not so much fun. But if you're doing this like in production, putting it together like this is much more fun because then you don't have to remember to chain together a bunch of different things. Um, Ooh, so this cat is having a really good time um, because this cat has found out about the wonders of Apache Arrow. How many people know about Apache Arrow? Ooh, more than I expected. Um, for the rest of you, <clears throat> I, uh, I'm not paid or endorsed by Apache Arrow, but you might get confused shortly. Um, it's the magical future. Ooh, if you trust vendors, this is 242 times faster. It is not, but it might be two times faster. And two is pretty close to 242. Um, see the earlier comment about floating points. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this, this future is probably over-promised, but that should not stop us from enjoying some of the cool parts of it. Um, and the, this is in Python. I'm, are there any Python users in the house? Don't be afraid. Two. And yeah, you were at PyCon. <laughs> okay, three and some other potentially scared people, I guess it's, but the, the nice thing about this is that Python is great for numerical computation, like adding two integers together. We all would not trust the JVM to do this operations. We need to go to Python, which will shell out to Fortran, which is where real math happens, according to some blog post I read on the internet. Um, and the cool thing about this is that, oh, ugh, OK, there was actually, hmm, I changed my slides right before this talk, and it looks like I deleted this part, which explained the cool part. So I'll just do it by hand. So the cool part about this is that we can actually take these pandas UDFs, and we can use them from Scala. Um, we have to do a whole bunch of boilerplate, or just copy and paste it, because copy and pasted code is great. Um, and then we can go ahead, and we can use our coworkers Python code really quickly. Does, does anyone work with people who work in non-JVM languages? That's a lot of people. How many of you enjoy rewriting your coworkers code to run on the JVM? There's like one and a half people who are into some weird shit, and that's fine. Um, <clears throat> whatever. It's fine if you want to rewrite your friend's code. Just don't tell them. Um, but the, the nice thing is we don't have to now. And we no longer, I mean, it's not 242 times faster. But 
the Python code that we call is no longer super expensive to call. We can we can use the bits of Python code really inexpensively. Um, and no, we, we can't use that part for streaming, but we can use the dataset API for streaming. Um, and that's the part where I have two different streaming engines that I can turn on and off and will actually sometimes override what decision I've made based on where I'm writing my data out to. Um, so I can configure it to use one streaming engine, but if I write my data to a source which doesn't support it, we just change it behind your back. It's a really great design mechanism that allows you to easily replicate your production environment locally. Okay, um, maybe I should do less sarcasm. Um, so yeah, it's new, structured streaming is new to Spark 2.0. And then after that, we were like, you know what? I'm getting bored, I want to write more new software. I don't want to fix the bugs in the old one. So that's why we brought the new execution engine in 2.3. And it's kind of cool. Um, and this is what it can look like. Um, I can compute my average happiness for coffees. Um, and I can do that with the DSL we were looking at earlier. And I can, I can put that terrible case class that I wrote earlier in here as well. Um, it's, it's really sad. Um, we can, sorry, we can also use map. However, there's a bunch of random functionality inside of the dataset functional API, which will compile, but not work at runtime on the dataset streaming API. So if you use this, you need really good tests. Otherwise, you'll be really sad. Okay. Um, and I want to leave us all on a sad note um, because happiness is overrated. And admittedly, I float between Python and Scala, so I will probably still have a job, I hope, knock on, whatever, mate. Um, but one of the things which is, which is kind of scary about this slide, which implies it's 242 times faster, is that the Python users who we used to be able to go to and be like, it's time to rewrite your code to be production ready, let's, let's put this in Scala, are just going to be like, nah, it's fine. It's good enough in Python. And that's, that's cool, but then we're losing this new source of people that we can bring into our community to keep it like happy and alive. And instead, the Python community can like steal them. Um, I mean, it's okay. Either way, I get paid. But I like functional programming, and I like types, so I want them to come to our community instead. Um, because otherwise, I have to write a lot of code without any types, and I'm just going to be really sad. Um, what other sad things do I have? Uh, yeah, OK. So uh, what, are, what are the main takeaways? So the main takeaways are, yeah, we, we do have functional APIs, sort of, in uh, data sets. Um, we added them after the fact, and it shows when you try and do anything beyond a map. right? Once, even if we try and do a simple aggregate, we end up getting delightful things like any and mutable row option, which are super clear. Um, and just so it's clear, rows can contain an arbitrary number of fields, all of which can be of almost but not quite any type. Um, and no, we don't know until we access it. It's great. Um, <clears throat> but don't worry, we can still sell enterprise support contracts and training to banks because data sets work better in Scala for now. And we can, we can write our functional programming against them. We just really have to hope that they're not looking too closely. Um, or we have to convince them to use frameless, which that's an option too. Um, SparkML uses data frames, which is the even more untyped precursor to data sets. Um, and that's like data frames, which are essentially never allowed to contain type information. Yeah, oh, sorry, data frames are data sets with explicitly no type information. So um, enter there, all hope is lost. But unfortunately, how many people's company is like excited about or investigating or working with machine learning? That's a lot of people, right? And that's kind of sad that if we want to do this cool stuff for now, we, we have to give up a lot of our cool toys. Um, and uh, yeah, you, you can, uh, is there anyone from San Francisco trying to raise a series A for their startup? Okay, yeah, we don't have to cover deep learning. Great. Um, yeah. 
Cool. Oh, we're getting, this is the second most important slide, and the most important slide will be coming up soon. Um, here is a collection of books about Spark. Um, here is the book where I make the most money. It is also about Spark. Um, it is largely focused on functional programming as well. Um, it's it's f written in Scala um, because it predates the part where you could write fast Python code for Spark. Um, also because I like Scala more. Um, no. Python people, I'm sorry. Please have me back at your conference. Um, and you can buy it from that scrappy Seattle bookstore because Jeff Bezos wants to buy another newspaper. And one copy of High Performance Spark is about a quarter of a cup of coffee in San Francisco. And you can help a developer from turning to a life of enterprise support contracts. Give generously with your corporate credit card today. Um, with your personal credit card, I don't don't waste your money. Um, I mean, definitely buy like one copy. But if you have a corporate card, it's a great gift for customers and people who don't want to bother returning it. Um, cool. Uh, I will be at the closing panel right after this. If anyone wants an excuse to go to London and get rained on, um, I will be there next week. And I will also be in Spain. If anyone wants an excuse to go to a place with a beach. I, is there a beach in Berlin? I don't think so. Oh, there is. Is it nice? Oh, yeah, okay. If anyone wants to go to a possibly nicer beach, um, you can join me at Jay on the Beach. And if you want to go to New York, Scala Days New York, I will be back in Berlin for FOSS Backstage and Berlin Buzzwords. And Amsterdam is always fun. Portland less so, but still nicer than... Um, some other places I've been. Ah, let's not name those. Okay, cool. Um, so I think I have time for questions. Okay, yeah, I've got five minutes left for questions. Um, hopefully this wasn't too depressing. I'm sorry. Yay, there's a question in the back. Okay. Hello. Oh, cool. Yay! Ooh, I should take a picture of the room. I should have taken a picture of the room in the middle before people started leaving. But I'll take a picture of the room now before everyone leaves so that it looks like I do good work. If you ever talk to my boss at Google, I am amazing. And um, the word is strongly exceed expectations. Um, that's that's what they want to hear in the review. Uh, do, you, do you have the microphone? Yeah, yeah I am. Uh, thanks for the talk, first of all. And, uh, is there any still uh, practical use of RDD? Uh, looks like DataFrame is a clear winner. Yeah, uh, so that's a great question. And the answer is uh, sort of. Um, data sets are often better. Um, part of that comes from having a really cool optimizer. One of the downsides of having a really cool optimizer is sometimes it goes on an adventure. Um, and this adventure takes longer than your actual job. Um, and so we have this really awesome optimizer that occasionally takes longer than your work. And so if you've got stuff like that, um, totally RDDs are better. Um, actually, one of the main cases where RDDs make more sense, uh, despite us building our new machine learning API on top of data sets, um, is for machine learning, because uh, data sets don't handle iterative algorithms very well. And most of machine learning is uh, iterative algorithms. So. We did a really good job with the design decision there. Um, and there's an open Jira to fix that issue. And it's been open for a few years. So uh, yeah, we're getting right on that. Um, cool. Uh, so yeah, machine learning and some other weird cases. Question. So well, first of all, I want to clarify that I think you've probably seen a fake eFinite PyCon. I'm really loyal to the Scala community. <laughs> okay, I, listen, it's fine. You could have been doing reconnaissance. I, I completely understand and respect that. And I, of course, love both Python and Scala equally. I like Scala better. <laughs> so, so um, there's a microphone. Oh, oh sorry. Um, <laughs> so my question is, um, Spark also offers um, nice um, functions for you to do machine learning. So yeah. when do you recommend a user to use Spark for machine learning? When do you recommend them to use TensorFlow or other tools for machine mm. learning? That's awkward because my employer um, <laughs> is a glorious employer who can do no wrong but is occasionally confusing. Um, 
produces TensorFlow, uh, along yeah. with the help of the community and other valued partners. Um, <clears throat> So, so my, my <laughs> sorry. sorry, my personal view is if like TensorFlow can be really great for transfer learning if you have terabytes of data, um, and you're not really sure what's going on. TensorFlow can be really awesome. I think for most machine learning use cases, transfer learning is perhaps a bit oversold. Like, um, if I'm if I'm doing image recognition and I'm looking for dogs and I have a thing that can find cats, okay. If I'm trying to go from a thing that can find cats to fraud, eh, maybe not so good. Um, and so I, I think TensorFlow for now is is a very specific use case. And Spark ML is um, whenever you have too much data to fit on a single machine and you want to do some cool machine learning with it, that is not deep learning. Although the Spark ML people will be happy to sell you a deep learning solution um, from one of their valued partners. <coughs> I, I'm not one of the valued partners, though, so like I don't want to. Sorry. OK. Uh, I come here to learn a bit about Spark. So I heard a lot of things which are not good in Spark. So my conclusion is, if you want to do cool stuff, don't do it with Spark. It's just the message. <laughs> it's, that's my takeaway today. So I'm so I'm, sorry. I'm confused. So what it is it? Should I use Spark yes, or not? Obviously. Or, or should I go to Flink? <laughs> Oh, no, no, no. Okay. So I want to be clear. Like, these are things which are hard in Spark, but don't worry. Everything is terrible. No, I, like, I'm serious. Like, everything sucks. If you go and find, like, some hardcore Flink users and you sit down with them and you're like, what is rough? They will not shut up. I mean, neither will I for Spark, right? Like, they're, th these are, these are rough points, right? And we, we can fix some of them together, hopefully. I'm, Oh, wait. Yes, OK, there, there. You're going to write that PR, and it's going to be amazing. Um, and the other parts we can avoid, right? Like if you need to do some cool functional programming, for now, you can use the RDD API. And yeah, it'll be a little slower, but that's all right. I'm a cloud provider. Just buy more computers. I have a bank. We can, we can borrow the money. That's great. <laughs> I love banks. Your, your credit cards very rarely have chargebacks. <laughs> Please buy more. So thank you very much. I'm afraid oh. we have to close it now so you okay. can get to the panel. Yeah, I'm I'll, sorry I'll for that. Panel. So yeah, you will be at the panel, but you need some time to get over there. And Well, yeah, I have to change out of these relaxed. sparkle heels. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. It was oh, a great talk. You.